Πάνω σε μια ταράτσα από κοκκινοπό πυλό ψημένο στον ήλιο, κάτω από τον ξάστερο τροπικό ουρανό, εγώ, ο Ζωζέ Αντώνιο Μαρία Μπάζ, στέκομαι μια πνιγερή και υγρή νύχτα και περιμένω το τέλος του κόσμου. Είμαι βρώμικος και παραλυρό. Τα ρούχα μου κρέμονται σε κουρέλια, έτοιμα να γλιστρήσουν από το κάτι σχνοκορμί μου. Στις τσέπες μου έχω αλεύρι και αυτό είναι για μένα πιο πολύτιμο και από το χρυσάφι. Γιατί πριν από ένα χρόνο ήμουν ακόμα κάτι. Ήμουν φούρναρης, ενώ τώρα δεν είμαι τίποτα. Ένα ζητιάνος που τριγυρίζει ανήσυχα τις μέρες κάτω από τον καυτό ήλιο και ύστερα περνά τις ατέλειωτες νύχτες πάνω σε μια εγκαταλειμμένη ταράτσα. Αλλά ακόμα και οι ζητιάνοι έχουν σημάδια που τους δίνουν μια ταυτότητα. Τους κάνουν να ξεχωρίζουν από όλου τους άλλους ζητιάνους που απλώνουν τα χέρια τους στις γωνιές του δρόμου σαν να θέλουν να τα δωρήσουν ή να πουλήσουν το ένα μετά τα άλλο τα δάχτυλά τους. Ο Ζωζέ Αντώνιο Μαρία Μπάζ είναι ένας πλάνητας που έγινε γνωστός ως χρονικογράφος των ανέμων. Ασταμάτητα σαλεύουν τα χείλη μου μέρα νύχτα σαν να διηγούμε μια ιστορία που κανένας ποτέ δεν άντεξε να ακούσει. Τελικά είναι σαν να έχω παραδεχτεί ότι ο μόνος μου ακροατή είναι ο Μουσώνας που έρχεται από τη θάλασσα. Προσεκτικός, περιμένει πάντα υπομονετικά, σαν ένας γέροντας ιερέας, να τελειώσει κάποτε η εξομολόγηση. Τις νύχτες καταφεύγω σε αυτή την εγκαταλειμμένη ταράτσα, αφού εκεί νιώθω ότι υπάρχει χώρος για μένα και ότι μπορώ να έχω θέαση του κόσμου. Οι αστερισμοί είναι βουβοί, δεν με χειροκροτούν, αλλά τα μάτια τους πυνθυρίζουν και τότε νομίζω ότι μιλάω κατευθείαν στο αυτή της αιωνιότητας. Επιπλέον μπορώ να σκύψω το κεφάλι και να δω την πόλη να πλώνεται μπροστά μου. Τη νυχτερινή πόλη, όπου ανήσυχε φωτιές τρεμοπαίζουν και χορεύουν. Αόρατα σκυλιά γελούν. Και συλλογίζομαι όλους αυτούς τους ανθρώπους που κοιμούνται και αναπνέουν και ονειρεύονται και αγαπούν εκεί κάτω. Ενώ εγώ βρίσκομαι πάνω στην ταράτσα μου και μιλάω για έναν άνθρωπο που δεν υπάρχει πια. Μοσαμπίκης country close to South Africa and I saw the horrifying thing of the apartheid system. I think it was it was really terrible but I also saw it go. Mm. Today there are no political apartheid system anymore mm. and they managed to get rid of it without the civil war and to me that is obviously what I also hope for in Israel with the Israelis and the Palestinians. Look at South Africa. They managed that which you have to do. And we know that uh, you will go to... To Gaza. Mm -hmm. To Gaza. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You will go to the... You will board on the flotilla. Yeah. That will. And it, it's, it will be the second time. It will be the second time, yeah. And what was your impression on the first time in May 2010? There's many things, but obviously I, I, I was very... astonished that the Israelis behaved so stupidly and so brutally that they they killed nine people and they murdered them. This was absolute murder. It was nothing else. Cold-blooded murder. And uh, I was astonished how come the Israelis are so stupid that they do this. And because they lost an enormous amount of goodwill in the world. And we can never talk about the success when people die. But we can say that after that, everyone in the world knew about the, the problem for Palestinian in, and Israel. But still, the problem is still there. Gaza is illegally block, in blockade of Israel. And I think it is a good way of trying to once again to break this blockade. And I can only hope that the Israelis will behave a little different this time. But you are also active in Africa, you are uh, creating villages for children, for orphan children. You have an activist side. Uh, yes, I am an activist. I've always been an activist. In the 60s, I was in the streets for Greece, for Spain, for Portugal, for Africa, for against Vietnam, well, you know, everything. And that is a part of my life. And then you can say as an intellectual, which I am, I also have to, I use my writing as much as I can, but sometimes I have also maybe to show myself in manifestations of being, as you say, an activist. 
Then there is no secret that I have earned an enormous amount of money on my writings. And I'm happy that I could spend a lot of that money by, for example, financing children's village, uh, children's village in Africa. And I have done many other things too, which I, because I have the possibility to do it. And you destroy every schematic things about authors. I remember a phrase of uh, Octavio Page yeah. that says that uh, authors have uh, no biographies, their biography is the books. This is not true for you. My books are a part of my biography, but I am a little more than that. I also, my theatre plays, my screen plays, and my doings as an intellectual. My great heroes are the people in France from the Enlightenment. I believe in the Enlightenment. I believe in knowledge. I believe in dialogue. You're making a film on uh, Igmar Bergman? No, I don't do the film. I write the, the script. The script, yes. Yeah. It's a sort of biography? No, it is... It's fiction. No, it's not fiction either. I, I wanted to... I wanted to think about the price he paid as an, as an artist with no compromises and the price his family paid. This is what interests me and that is the script I've written. This is from Ingmar Bergman. He had in the beginning of all his movies, this was the symbol of cinematograph. And after that he, he died, I, I bought it. First of all, I am a writer, I'm an artist. If I do not manage to write good, do good art, then I should do something else. But I don't believe that there is any real good novel written that hasn't had sort of serious thing to say about the world. Of course, Dostoevsky is a political writer, even though he writes in his specific way. Kazantzakis is absolutely a political writer. So I, I, I think it's how on earth would I write, write a book without having a theme or an idea? What I don't believe in is that write about a good book is always about many things. I, I really dislike, you know, this is a book about one thing. That would be terrible. If I have it here, this is why I, would, I wouldn't read it. And the only books I can write is the books that I would like to read myself. And literature uh, must be easy, must be accessible yeah. to everyone yeah. or yeah. not? I think there will always be books that will not be read by all people. And some of these books will be probably the most important books. The book market today, you might say I'm a part of the problem, where fewer and fewer authors are selling more and more. I don't feel guilty to that problem. It is the publishing houses that has created this, which is a terrible thing. And that is also why I started my own publishing house uh, 10 years ago, exactly, together with my friend that had been my lecturer the whole time. We started the publishing house, The Leopard, uh, because we wanted to see that the money that came in from my books could be done into new other books from Africa, from Asia that would never find the market in Sweden. And we will start now our e-book company. We have to do it. Uh, because what is happening now is once again, the distribution of the book is revolutionary changing. And uh, I think that next year, even in a country like Sweden, you will see an enormous explosion of people buying via internet the books, e-books. And we have to be part of that. Standing on the corner 
in your books you are um, criticizing the Swedish uh, model. What has gone wrong with, uh, with it? I think that people outside of Sweden has created a sort of mythology about Sweden, that Sweden in a way was the perfect society. We never were. You did it <laughs> as an image of us. So what we I try, <laughs> what I yes, but yeah, in a way. But what I try to do is to give a more fair view of Sweden as decent, but with problems. The problem is that um, in even a very decent society, you can uh, find that uh, violence is always there. That uh, yeah. men can be violent even if they have solved, resolved uh, many problems, mm -hmm. even if they have money. And you as a writer, as an intellectual, how you can uh, explain that? Well, I can explain it very easily that, and I can compare Sweden with Mozambique. Uh, Mozambique is one of the most poor countries in the world. Mm. Sweden is one of the richest countries in the world. You have violence in both countries. And actually the violence is based on the same thing. Because even if rich, in a rich country like Sweden, there are poor people. There are young people without work. There are young people that really don't have very much. And the, those are the people that commit most violence and most crime. Because based that they are relatively poor in even the Swedish society. And this is the same reason why people commit crime in Mozambique. Because there are rich people there and you have all the poor people. So I think that it is the circumstance of poverty, the gap between the, the rich and the poor, which you feel now very much in Greece, this problem also. And uh, that is why the crime and the violence comes from. That's one reason. There is one more reason. And that is that we have built a society where young people are losing their identity in many ways because the parents work so much so they don't have time for the children and they don't find work when they need and they lose their identity. And it is these children that goes out in the street with a knife in their hand. If we could find work for these children, if you can give them an identity, they wouldn't go out with a knife in their hand. I'm quite sure about that. So I think this is a warning what is happening now in a country like Sweden. Because most of these crimes is committed by young, angry men. And, and I when understand you think the anger. about the identity, you don't, uh, you don't mean the Swedish identity or the ethnic identity. No, I mean an identity as a human being that feels I am I, I have value. People want me to be here. And this is a problem because so many people doesn't feel welcome. Because no one wants them, there's no work for them, there's nothing. Δύο εβδομάδε αργότερα, ο Πέδρο έφυγε από το χωριό, κουβαλώντα την κόρη του σε ένα καλάθι στην πλάτη. Ο αδερφό του, ο Χουάν, τον πήρε στο κατόπι. Μα τι πα να κάνει, τον ρώτησε. Αυτό που πρέπει να γίνει. Μα γιατί να πα στην πόλη να βαφτίσει την κόρη σου, γιατί δεν τη βαφτίζει εδώ, στο χωριό. Ο ιερέα μια χαρά μα φέρεται. Και εμά και στου γονεί μα πριν από εμά. Ο Πέδρο σταμάτησε και κοίταξε τον αδερφό του. Οχτώ χρόνια περιμέναμε ένα παιδί και μόλις επιτέλους γεννήθηκε η κόρη μας η Ντολόρες, πέθανε. Ούτε τα τριάντα δεν είχε κλείσει ακόμα. Αναγκαστικά πέθανε. Επειδή είμαστε φτωχοί. Επειδή έχουμε τις αρρώστιες της φτώχειας. Γι' αυτό τώρα θα πάω στο μεγάλο ναό, τον καθεδρικό, εκεί πέρα στην πλατεία όπου συναντηθήκαμε. Η κόρη μου θα βαφτιστεί στη μεγαλύτερη εκκλησία που υπάρχει σε τούτη εδώ τη χώρα. Είναι το λιγότερο που μπορώ να κάνω για την Τολόρες. Δεν περίμενε καν την απάντηση του Χουάν. Αργά, το ίδιο βράδυ, όταν έφτασε στο χωριό από όπου καταγόταν η Τολόρες, σταμάτησε στο σπίτι της μάνας της. Της εξήγησε και εκείνη που πήγαινε. Η γριά κούνησε με λύπη το κεφάλι της. «Ο καημό σου θα με τρελάνει», του είπε. Νωρί όμως, το άλλο πρωί, ο Πέδρος συνέχισε το ταξίδι του. Όσο περπατούσε, 
έλεγε στην κόρη του όλα όσα θυμόταν από τη γυναίκα του. Και όταν δεν είχε άλλα να πει, άρχιζε πάλι από την αρχή. Do you find that uh, there is a difference uh, between the Scandinavian uh, crime novels and the Mediterranean and the English? I think that uh, the Scandinavian literature is more interested in looking at the context of crime. You know, what I said, it being the mirror of crime. Looking psychological. Upon, yeah, well, more of the socio-psychological. Why is things happening in a society? Why do you have these contradictions? And I think that this is always has been special for the crime writings in the Scandinavian literature. In England, you have more about who, who, who did it. Yeah. You read the first pages and then you go to the end. When you started to write uh, crime novels, the model was uh, what, America and... Uh... I think that inspiration to me has been Graham Greene, John Le Carré, mm. <laughs> uh, absolutely Sherlock Holmes, these wonderful stories. There is a lot of things to be, to steal from Conan Doyle, <laughs> from Sherlock Holmes. So I found an inspiration from many different places. Uh, I think if you talk about an American writer, I think Thomas Harris is a very good writer. He was written about Hannibal. Mm, yeah. He's very good. So you always work in a tradition. I also think that Ed McBain, once upon a time, was very good. And uh, Raymond Chandler and all these guys. So I, I think I found the inspiration 2,000 years ago, and books written today, and I, I find my way into this. I am a storyteller. I try to tell stories about complications in people's life. I try to talk about how people are changing or be, becoming something that they didn't was on the first page. I try to write stories that I would like to read myself. That is the only thing I can say. And I try to find my stories with the questions everywhere, really. I have written stories, historical stories. I've written from Africa. I've written about Europe, Africa. I think I'm looked upon as a writer that always surprises people with coming with something completely different every time. Then I also think that the part of my important thing that I've been writing is uh, plays, theater plays and screen plays for film and TV. So I try to do a lot of various things. Do you use the experience of a crime uh, writer in the other novels? I mean, the suspense, the, uh, the, yeah, yeah, the factor to... Yeah, yeah. Huh? I think I have to. I mean, uh, <laughs> if you have a book like that, you always have to force the reader to turn the page. So you always have to do it in an exciting way. And this is what I say. I, I can only write a book that I would like to read myself. It would be terrible <laughs> if I wrote a book that I would do like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, of course, there is a technique. Yes. It must be. It is a question of language and it's also a question of musicality. Mm. You know, if you start to read a book and you feel now this is not a good book, then I probably could say this is because it is an unmusical book. Because there is music also in books. The rhythm, the tempo, all that we call music. And you find it also in a book, because if you have an unmusical book, you can't read it, I promise you. Think about that next time you read a book.